If you remember from last week, we're going to be in 1 Peter, and so as an introduction to 1 Peter, I wanted to go through what we know about Peter, because the Holy Spirit chose to inspire Peter, the disciple, the apostle Peter, to write these books to the churches, as I told you last week, these churches are in the Turkey area. These are Christians, uh, probably some Jewish Christians, largely Gentile Christians, and Peter is writing to them about a number of things, but to understand sort of what Peter's been through, we've been kind of going through his story in the scripture, and so as we left it last time, I believe we were uh, right where Peter had denied Christ. And maybe we had already gone through that. Hey, hey, there's my papers. It helps to have my notes. It does help. But we have here is we have Peter. Christ has told him he's going to deny him three times. And then we see what happens. I'm just going to read through it quickly here. This is Luke 22, 54 through 62. Bible's in front of you if you want them. We'll be on the screen unless that breaks. Okay. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them, and a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, I'm sure he was getting nervous as she's looking intently at him. This man was also with him, with Jesus, but he denied him, saying, woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, you also are of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, surely this fellow was also with him, for he is a Galilean. See, Peter talked different. Be like trying to hide your Georgia accent in the Northwest. You're going to be like, no, you're from Georgia, right? You know, right? But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're saying. I put a little southern on there just to give you the idea of what a Galilean might sound like. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. So here's Peter, here's this person, here's this disciple, always, as we, as we went through last time, always ready with the, hey, I'm going to build these tabernacles for you. Hey, I've got this to say, and I've got that to say. And Peter's the kind of guy you're like, shh, right? He, but he's bold. He's, I will come out to you on the water, all that stuff. And then a girl says, I think you might have been with Jesus. He goes, no, no, I'm not. Not perfect. It's not perfect. He wept bitterly. He knew what it meant. Now we're going to go through as quickly as we can, actually the whole chapter of John 21, because I think that it lays out very well sort of Peter in a number of facets. So let's just kind of go through that. We're in John 21. It says, after these things, this is after the resurrection. Okay, that's the things that are going on. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two others of his disciples. These guys are like, why didn't my name get in it? You named these other guys. Anyway, I, they're probably thinking that. They're probably not. Um, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. He likes to fish. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. And when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. If somebody's on the shore far away, you're not necessarily going to know who it is, right? Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, No embarrassed as fishermen who caught no fish. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. You may remember this has happened before. So now they're going to understand who's talking to them over there, right? Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, that's what John calls himself in his gospel, He's the disciple Jesus loved. He loved all of them, but he had a special relationship with the Lord. Said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now listen to this. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Now as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. Now, a couple things I want you to, to think about before we keep going. P 
Peter realizes it's Jesus, and his reaction is immediate. I want to be with Jesus. I'm not missing this opportunity. He literally jumps into the sea and starts making his way to the shore to see Jesus. But this is interesting, and it could be best, I suppose. I'm just kind of noticing it right now. Jesus gives them a command. Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. And he goes from, I'm going to go see Jesus for me, and immediately He's the one who does what Jesus asks. He's the one who does it. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Don't know how many of you eat fish for breakfast. Not my thing. Not my thing. But if Jesus was serving it, I'd eat it for sure. For sure. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. Once again, this is a familiar thing for them, right? Now, this is the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Am I first? Am I first? Let's not forget that Peter has denied the Lord three times. And now Jesus says to him, okay, am I first now? Have you learned? Am I first? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And that's, of course, a theological statement. Of course, Jesus knows. He knows the answer. He doesn't ask questions he doesn't know the answer to. He says, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Gives him a command. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter's thinking, I think we just had this conversation. Or as we'd say in the law, asked and answered, right? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was, was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? How many times did he deny? Three times. How many times does Jesus restore? Three times, right? Three times. Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Oh, here we have this moment where Jesus restores Peter after Peter's terrible mistake that he made, largely by thinking he was in a better place than he was. Remember, Jesus says, hey, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. He says, pray that you might not fall into temptation. He tells him he's going to deny. And Peter doesn't do those things. He takes a nap while Jesus is in the garden praying. And then what do you know? Bam! He falls into fear. He falls into temptation. He was not keeping his eyes eyes on the Lord. He was not staying vigilant. And this thing happened to him. And now he gets it. He wept bitterly. Now he wants to run to the Lord. And the Lord restores Peter. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. He says here, this he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So Peter's told a few things here. He said, feed my sheep. You need to be pastoral, right? Feed my sheep. Be there for them. And then he tells them, just so you know, what he's saying here is, you're going to die. The evidence that, that we have is that Peter was probably crucified and possibly crucified upside down on a cross. Okay? Not where he wished to go, but that he was going to die for the Lord. And then he says to him with this last command, follow me. Now, Peter's got one thing to think about now. Feed his sheep, follow him. Everything else in his life should have faded into second, third, fourth, tenth. And right here, Jesus, follow me, feed my sheep. He has a direct command. Sometimes people wonder, what's my calling? What's my calling? Would the Lord just tell me? Well, the Lord told him directly, directly. How does Peter react? Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. Keep your eyes on me, Peter, so you don't fall in the water. Keep your eyes on me, Peter, so you don't deny me. Hey, follow me. That means you've got to be looking. Let me turn around and says, oh, there's John, the disciple Jesus loved. Following. 
who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? This is referring, so we know this is who John is. Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Because God said, what I want you to do is follow me and worry about what everybody else is doing, right? It's not what he said. Jesus said to him, and this is one for every one of us, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. All of this other stuff, what, that's not your jurisdiction. That's not your business. I've told you what to do. You follow me. Stop looking around and follow me. End of the chapter. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple, that's John, would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. In fact, he did die. But if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? That was the point. This is the disciple who testifies of these things, again, John, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. So that's John 21, that we see Peter going through this whole thing. We see this back and forth. I think that all of us can recognize this back and forth from our own lives. Our own lives where it's like, man, here I am. You might come out of a sermon, probably not one of mine, but maybe Pastor Dave's or something, fired up for Jesus, right? You're ready to go. You've got, you're, you're ready to go. And I mean, five minutes down the road, somebody cuts you off. Or your husband says something and you're just like, you are, mm, right? Or what, I mean, you were on it. I remember coming back from summer camp when I was a kid. Like, I'm getting everybody saved. Everyone is going to be saved at my school. Nintendo. Right? It's just like, it's just, you just get <laughs> off, distracted. Yes. Peter can do that literally. If, you can, if this can happen to a man who clearly is in love, which he loves Jesus, and Jesus is right there, and a moment later he can be off course, then don't be surprised that we struggle with it too. The question isn't whether you struggle with it. The question is, how long does it take to get your eyes back on Jesus? That's the question that Peter has to ask himself. I heard about this study. Now, to be fair, I don't usually get my research from Instagram Reels or YouTube Shorts. In this case, that's where I heard it. So I'm not positive that it's true, but the guy seemed like a smart guy that was saying it. So I'm going <laughs> to... And it makes sense. This is what he said. He said there was a study. Um, and again, I can't confirm it. And he said that people were asked, so these college professors, they asked a bunch of people, and this was the question they had. You can either make $100,000 at a job. You're going to get a job, one of these two jobs. You can either make $100,000, but all of your coworkers make $200,000. Or you can have this job that pays you $50,000, but all of your coworkers make $25,000. And according to this guy, 50% of the people said, I'll take that second job. I'll take half the money to know that I make more than them. They're not looking at the money, at their family, at the Lord, at what they can do. They're looking at everybody else and wanting to make sure they're higher. That was the answer of 50%. I get it if it was like, or 99,000 they make. It was half the amount of money. Half the amount of money. Our concern with others is poison to our growth. Peter's concern with John was clearly in the way of what Jesus then said. What is that to you? You follow me. What is that to thee? It's nothing. You follow me. Don't poison your growth by worrying about what John's doing. That's just not the way it works. People invent ladders and they try to figure out where they stand on the ladder. Right? When the greatest that has ever been, the Lord of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, came down and took on flesh. He washed the feet of the disciples. That was his model. He died for us. He allowed himself to be humiliated for us. Where do we get the concern about what others get or how we compare to others? Not from him. That's not a thing that he modeled. He modeled absolute meekness, power under control, confidence, love, hope, humility, always submitting to the will of the Father as the Son. 
and we're looking around asking, what about him? What about her? Why does he get that? I was on social media, and this joker over here, who I did better than in school, and I'm better looking than him anyway, and I'm taller than him, why is he on vacation at this place? Or why did he get that new car? Or why did he do whatever? Why does she get that? Why is everybody talking about her? Why is he in charge? I should be in charge. Why don't I get, this, you'll hear this in church sometimes, and I think all of us have probably struggled, why don't I get to use my gifts the way I want to use them? Why am I not being recognized? Why am I not being honored? We struggle. What about me? What about me? Me, me, me. What about you? Jesus died for you. I'm sorry, are you asking for something more? Because it's a bit, as the British would say, cheeky. It's a bit cheeky. Romans 5 but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is that enough? Or do you also need to know that your neighbor doesn't have what you have? Or that you're honored more than the Christian brother or sister next to you? Or that you get to be in charge? What about him? What about her? Nope. He died for you. Follow him. He rose from the dead and is giving you hope for eternal life. Follow him. Jesus chose you. Do you understand the, how significant that is? It's right here. Second verse of, of 1 Peter. This first word here. This is, this is verse uh, 1, 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Now we're going to get into more of what that's about. But the very first word here, elect, that means he chose you. You were chosen. You were chosen. You are special. He will have a name that just you and him know. He has made you unique to every other human that's ever been created. There's something about you that he is crazy about. So if you look at the other person, what are you crazy about with them? Is it something better than the thing I have? <laughs> I can just imagine Jesus like, seriously, we just had this thing. I restored you, Right? We did the whole thing, and I was like, follow me. This should have been this moment. And the first thing he does, what about, what about him? Be content. Be content. Following Jesus. There is nothing better that you could ever do than follow Jesus. Be content in doing that. Let God lift you up. Let him lift you up. Luke 14, 7 through 11. So he told a parable to those who were invited. This is Jesus talking. When he noted how they chose the best places. So people would go into the wedding feast, right? And it was sort of in order. There was kind of like a ladder system, right? So these people, they were more honored than these people. I didn't say it's the best system, but it's realistic. There are certain things we honor people for. If I go to a convention, John uh, Robinson, he likes sci-fi. If I go to a sci-fi convention, a Star Trek convention, I'm not sitting at the first seat, right? They're going to put me outside because I'm like, Star Wars? I don't know. What's the, is this the Chewbacca one? And they're going to be like, get out of here. <laughs> be gone, blasphemer. That's what they're going to say, right? I'm not going to be honored at the Star Trek convention because I'm not a nerd. So <laughs> I actually love Star Trek. I'm just using that as an example. But there, there was that. So what, what would happen is people go in, and if they choose a seat that's high up on the table, there he is. I knew I'd bring him back in. If you choose a seat that's high up on the table, of course, you've got the chance that something bad might happen to you. And this is what it says. This is what Jesus says. When you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place. Lest one more honorable than you be invited by him, and he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man. In other words, get up. This is this guy's seat. Awkward, right? And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. 
And you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's what the Lord says. And who exalts? Well, the the person at the wedding feast, the one in charge, of course, in our case, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. You want to make yourself higher, that Romans 12, 3, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. You want to do that? I can tell you what's coming for you. Humiliation. Humiliation. You humble yourself or you are humiliated. Those are your choices. There is nobody who gets to stand up tall and say, I'm the man. The angel who did that is Satan. When we do that, that's what we're acting like. Hey, we're, we're all this. How was Eve pulled into sin? You'll be like God. Knowing good from evil. He doesn't want you to be higher up. Compare yourself to him and then try to have this thing. It's evil. And when we do it, we're falling into that ourselves, worrying about our accomplishments as they pertain to someone else. James 4.10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Not just humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and you'll be humiliated. That's not what it says. If you'll be humble, he'll lift you up. Have a humble view of yourself, and part of that is not looking at what others get. Look at everyone else as more honorable than yourself, and a couple things will happen. A, you'll be biblical because you'll be humbling yourself. And B, you're more likely to love and honor and respect and care for other people and not make judgments about them in, their mind, in your mind and put them somewhere lower on the ladder than you. This is the same thing I believe James talks about where he says, hey, when a rich person comes in, don't be giving them the best seat. Hey, you sit here in this this good seat. And then a poor person comes and says, yeah, you sit by my feet. You sit over here. What is that? Evil, judgment, lack of humility. You think you're better? Then you're not humbling yourself. Humble yourself and the Lord will lift you up. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7. This is why I'm bringing this up because Peter learned this. And then the Holy Spirit inspired him to write this in the book that we're going to be studying in 1 Peter. This is later in the book. We'll get to exegeting this later. But I want you to see that he learned this after the whole what about him thing. He learned this. This is what what the Holy Spirit inspires Peter to write. This is later in the the book in chapter 5, 5 through 7. Likewise, you younger people, submit to your elders. That's a hard one for some people. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. Does that take humility? It takes humility. Submission takes humility. And be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Peter this is, this is the part where we wrap around, where we go, okay, what about Peter's life plays into this, to this book that he wrote, this letter that he wrote? What do we need to understand? Well, if you understand the author and you understand what God's shown him, you can understand something, another layer of the scripture, which is God often is showing these people, whether it's Paul, whether it's Peter, whatever, he's showing them how to grow, and you get to see how they grow through what the Holy Spirit inspires them to eventually teach. What's Peter's problem? Not a lot of humility. What about him? Right? I mean, how many times do we read about the disciples arguing about who was the greatest? And Jesus is like, oh my gosh. This is ridiculous. James and John sending their mommy up to Jesus. Hey, will will you let my, my son sit at your right and your left hand? You're a grown man. Go ask him yourself. Mommy, will you go talk to Jesus for me (laughs) and see if he'll make me better than the other boys? And she did it. So, like, that's a mom if I've ever known one, right? (laughs) Well, of course you should be better than the other boys. Does he even recognize you? This can happen in a lot of ways. Some of the moms are like, oh, that's me. Um, It's fine. You should love your children. But when your children, when your young men become men, don't let them act like babies. Um, that's one you can take for free. Here's the thing. <laughs> Here's the thing. And I'm out of time. So we're not getting through it again all the way. That's okay. 
Studying the scripture takes work, okay? Peter grows. And, and here's the thing. I need Peter <laughs> because I'm a disaster. And I say dumb things. If you would like an organized list of them, my wife would be happy to provide that for you. <laughs> my children, anyone who spends time with me would be happy to provide that for you, right? I know I want to follow Jesus. I love Jesus. And yet I get my focus off. I love Jesus, and yet sometimes it's just like you are a bonehead, right? And so do you. And yet the Lord restores, and you just keep saying the same thing. Follow me. Yep, I know, I know. I know the bills. I know. He's not unaware. Remember, Peter says to him, you know all things. He knows. You guys have the bills coming. Christmas is coming. You don't feel like you can buy enough gifts. You know what? It's okay. You know what your kids and your grandkids need? They need you. They need Jesus. They need someone who's focused on following him. They don't need another Barbie. I don't know what people buy these days. My kids are old now. God knows what you need. God knows what you're going through. That relationship, that thing. If you will focus, as he tells Peter to, not on all the things of the world, not on the waves as they're crashing, as Peter's walking on the water, not any of that, but on him and follow him. You will find that godly humility because there's only one thing that you're called to. Follow me. And so as Peter learned it, we need to learn it. And we can go to Peter, as I often also go to the Corinthian church because they were a disaster. And I go, okay, we're still okay. You know, we don't, there's some of the things they're talking about there, we're, at least we're not doing that, right? It's kind of like the reason people watch Jerry Springer, right? Like, at least it's not that. Some of you are like, no, I'm worse. And that's okay too. That's what Jesus is for. That's what Jesus is for. But listen, here's the thing. I want us to learn from Peter so that as we read the book, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write, we can also learn and put, and put it in our mind, hey, let's connect that to what he's learned. 